Hi, this is Steve Guarona, and you're listening to Campus Public Safety Online from the National Center for Campus Public Safety. Our topic today is adaptive continuity planning, and we're starting with two quick polling questions now on your screen, which our speakers would, likely, would like you to answer to help guide their presentation. While you're responding to those questions, here's a brief orientation to the Adobe Connect interface we're using. On the left side of your screen, you'll see a box labeled questions and comments where you can read and type messages. There's a tab labeled everyone at the bottom of this box, and that's the tab you'll use for all of your general messages, including questions and comments for our speakers. We'll be breaking for discussion several times during the presentation, so please do not hold your questions to the end. You can also send direct messages to a specific person by hovering your cursor over a name in the attendee list. One of those names is technical help, and that's the place to go if you run into technical problems. We're also monitoring Twitter for your questions and comments. Use hashtag NCCPSWebinar. That's NCCPSWebinar. If you miss part of today's conversation, or if you want to see some or all of it again, this webinar is being recorded and captioned. The link will be available on the NCCPS webinars page in about a week. And watch your email for a link to a brief evaluation survey requesting your reactions and comments on today's session. Please take a minute to respond to that survey when the link arrives. We do appreciate your feedback. And now for today's presentation. The traditional business approach to continuity planning entails comprehensive data collection and time-consuming dependency mapping. But a new model, adaptive continuity, is beginning to gain some traction. The goal of adaptive continuity is to rapidly identify how a department can increase their capabilities and immediately begin to support true recoverability, the ability to continue operations in the face of any disruption. Our speakers today are directors of emergency management who will, who will discuss case studies in adaptive continuity at their two universities. Sarah Powell is Director of Emergency Management for Temple University, providing strategic direction, subject matter expertise, and operational coordination for the university's emergency management and mission continuity programs. She has served as a consultant and subject matter expert for state and local governments on projects pertaining to emergency management, public health, and behavioral health response. She's an adjunct faculty member at Temple and also at Jefferson University, teaching on the psycho psychosocial impacts of critical incidents and disasters. She holds a bachelor's degree from Temple University and a master's degree in medical anthropology from McGill University. Emma Stocker is director of emergency management for Portland State University, where she leads emergency management and disaster preparedness efforts for the campus, coordinates the PSU incident management team and emergency notification system, and assists departments with response and continuity planning. Prior to joining PSU, Emma was planning coordinator with the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization, a five-county consortium in the Portland, Oregon metro area. She holds a master's degree in public administration from the University of Oregon and a bachelor's degree in sociology from Reed College. Sarah Powell and Emma Stocker, welcome to Campus Public Safety Online. Sarah, I believe you're going to kick things off. Thank you, Steve. So as you mentioned, I am the Director of Emergency Management, and I have been in the emergency management, continuity, and public health preparedness arena for 15 years. So this presentation is going to address the ways in which Temple has been learning from and applying the adaptive continuity approach to our institutional planning. You can see here that we're a pretty big institution. We have a heavy undergraduate count, and we have about you know, upwards of 8,000, 9,000 faculty, staff, and administration. Believe it or not, that makes us pretty lean in terms of our administration. And I know that sometimes people have questions about what are the differences between a large institution that might perceive to have a lot of um, resources for continuity and a smaller institution like a, a smaller liberal arts college. We actually might not be that different in terms of the resources available. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So if you Google continuity, this image comes up. And when I talk about this with a, a lot Sarah, of Sarah, um, just h hang on a second. Uh, I think we're not, uh, I think your slides are not advancing. Let's try again. Uh, they're advancing on my screen, so I'm not sure. There we are. What, what the issue okay. might be. Now, now I think, now I, which, which slide are you on on your screen? I'm on slide four. Okay. 
Um, we, we probably didn't pick up on what was on two and three if it was necessary. I think we had a setting missed uh, there. Sorry about that. No problem. So I think we're good to go unless you want to move back to two and three and say something about them. No, we can start here. So if you, if you Google continuity, this is a picture that can come up right away. And the question I like to ask people is, what's happening here? You know, why is this so symbolic of continuity planning? The words that come to my mind are, you know, being overwhelmed or, you know, being completely devastated by a disaster or by, you know, what needs to happen in that space. So the thing that I really like to look at here is that this is the original inspiration for that image, surely. And Caspar David Friedrich was a 19th, an 18th century romantic who focused on the subject of the sublime. So it's really the opposite message. And the thing that I want us to challenge today is our thinking about what is the task of continuity planning? What is the goal? And what opportunities do we have to really be creative and innovative in this space? So. I definitely find that people who have a lot of experience in continuity planning historically might feel some internal resistance to some of the approaches that Adaptive is taking. But this is not a proven model yet. It's really the tip of the spear. We're, we're trying to change how this has been done for the last 20 years because we've had a hard time making it as, you know, it's proving the value of continuity planning in the way that we should. So this is the starting point for dialogue. The current frameworks for continuity planning including, uh, include NFPA 1600. So some of you might be using that. It's common from the emergency management position. Uh, FEMA also provides some guidance. And ISO 22301 is really the starting point for most of the corporate world in terms of continuity. Some of the hallmarks of these models include a BIA, business impact analysis, uh, risk analysis and assessment, and things like recovery time objectives. The thing is that some of these things are finding themselves to be of dubious value. So Hubert in 2012 wrote about why the BIA suffers from theoretical and practical deficits that can't be overcome. They're typically old before they're complete. And you know, there's a real question about what that data is really doing for the practitioner. You know, is risk analysis being done by risk management already? Are we reinventing the wheel when we do a secondary risk analysis? And things like recovery time objectives really are often faulty and kind of pointless a lot of the time because though they might help set priorities, they're very um, imprecise in terms of when we can actually get different functions up and running again. So again, if this leads to so much frustration, what is the goal of the continuity practitioner? I think that there's a crisis in the business continuity arena because we don't know how to prove the value. And why is this so hard? For people in continuity, it seems evident that there's value. So why is it tough to get buy-in from leadership? Why are we struggling to, to collect so much data? And why do continuity practitioners seem to keep adding more and more to their plates in order to prove that the function has some kind of value? I stole this slide from Emma. She's our amazing presenter who's going to be coming in later. And we, we, she came upon this. We used it in another joint presentation that we did. And I think it really, really illustrates what we're talking about when we talk about continuity. So I want to establish a few baseline understandings of what we're dealing with. Continuity planning, or continuity itself, comes after the emergency management priorities of life safety. So life safety happens first. Are people safe? Are they out of the building? Are they in a safe location? That sort of thing. But continuity is also not long-term recovery. It's really this sloppy, held together with duct tape period of time after an incident happens. So people are safe. We've got to keep things going. And then we can really engage with long-term recovery strategies. So don't try to, to achieve 100% complete normalcy. That will come. 
the pathway is really the continuity pathway. The second baseline thing I want to establish is that many disasters are actually caused by events that were thought to be improbable to the point of impossible. We call them black swan events. So if we focus too much on the incident, we're also sort of missing the point of continuity. Nobody predicted with any real accuracy that 9-11 terrorist attacks were going to happen. The risk assessment piece is really important because it does prioritize the resources that we put into preparedness. But make sure that yours is not redundant. Make sure that if, it, if risk management or emergency management is already conducting a risk analysis, you can use that because continuity is to focus on the effects of a disruption. How does the institution recover rather than what is exactly causing that disruption? So what do we want to accomplish here? In a crisis where we're trying to continue our operations, what do we need? I don't necessarily want a giant binder full of text and data that I don't need. I also don't want an enormous matrix of data that I'm going to spend more time collecting than using. So even worse are these programs that end up with 400 different Word documents. I mean, I do not have the bandwidth to deal with that many documents. The biggest thing, though, is this. I don't have time. Seriously, I have no time. I have a massive institution with you know, some 500 different departments programs, and there is no commodity more precious to me than time. So if continuity is going to deliver value, I have to be very creative about exactly how I'm delivering that value. There is a place for data, but what is the most essential data? and information. Where do we store it? How do we use it? And then what is the tacit knowledge within the minds of personnel? And how does that translate into what needs to be done? Managers typically know what the priorities need to be. So we need to talk to people and drill down and understand some of that tacit knowledge. Finally, the real key here is about action steps. Focus on that as the most important deliverable that the continuity practitioner has to offer. This is where I think adaptive is really set apart from traditional business continuity. Traditional continuity that I've experienced is more about the data collection and the gathering of knowledge than it is about translating that information into tangible action steps. So where does this come from? Well. These two guys, David Lindstedt, Mark Armour, create a manifesto probably about eight years ago or so, and they create a framework. They're calling it an approach, and they're saying it's distinctive from the methodology of traditional business continuity. Implementation, not quite there. Again, this is the tip of the spear. So I'm just going to tell you a, a little bit of a story. David Lindstedt is presenting at a Continuity Insights conference in New York City a few years ago. And every single presentation I see at this conference is loading more onto the plate of the continuity practitioner. Data collection. Collect all the data. We should be the hub of all data for the entire organization. We should do 300 plans, 500 plans, 300 exercises. Everything is about quantitative metrics. And then David comes up and he says, eh, we shouldn't do any of that. We should focus on one thing, recoverability and basically scrap most of the rest of it, which might be a little bit of the nuclear option. I'm not necessarily saying that that's true. People love their BIA. They don't want to let go of it. I get it. But we do need some of that information. It's just, when are we collecting that information? And are we using the information in the best possible way? So this is a textbook that's out there. It can give you a starting point. Both Emma and I have found that though we like the framework, the way we want to implement it is different. And here's what we have to learn from. Project management 20 years ago started to undergo a real change. I mean, you might be familiar with the waterfall method of project management. You might have heard about you know, lean organizational management that kind of swept the corp through the corporate world, especially learning from some of the Japanese car makers like Toyota. But this is a really good lesson for us in the continuity field. The centerpiece of Lean and Agile was to use incremental iterative, iterative work cadences called sprints. 
meaning you do some work, you spend two weeks doing this work, and then you deliver value immediately. And that's sort of the key here. If you want to save time, how do we deliver value much more quickly? And how do we engage people in a process where they're excited? So if continuity practitioners have continued to be frustrated by the same problems all the time, isn't it time that we seek ways to innovate? So in the next part of my presentation, I'm going to be talking about how we've started to use this at Temple and to take inspiration from these different kinds of methodologies. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, you are listening to Campus Public Safety Online, and today we're talking about adaptive continuity planning. We're hearing from Sarah Powell right now, and in a little while we'll hear from Emma Stocker. If you have comments or questions for our speakers, uh, type them into that area that says questions and comments on your screen, and we will ask them during some breaks that we have planned. Uh, Sarah, someone wonders, how does an institution achieve clarity on institutional risk appetite? Well, here's my approach towards risk. Number one, I do believe that enterprise risk is a really important function more and more. And what that means is it's looking at all the types of risk that a university might take. So not just, you know, what kinds of hazards like fires or floods could occur, but also things like how are we investing our money and what kind of infrastructure are we building. Um, I think the continuity fits into an enterprise risk model, and that risk appetite really needs to happen at the executive level. That's really not something for us to focus on. But when we're, when we're focusing on recoverability, we're really focusing on what can we do right now to increase our ability to bounce back. And let me squeeze one more question in during this break. Um, what is the applicability to private sector business continuity planning? This is a fantastic question. Um, let me just start by saying that in higher ed, we're super lucky when it comes to this kind of experimental, innovative approach in the sense that we are not heavily regulated in the same way that the financial services world might be. But what I can say is this. We all want to get this job done well. And there is a lot of flexibility in the standards in terms of how do we implement it. So I was speaking with someone who is an EMAP, um, a, a person who goes through and, and surveys around EMAP accreditation. And, you know, sometimes people worry about the EMAP standard. The truth is there's a lot of flexibility in how we apply this to a different kinds of standards. And there actually are a lot of corporate um, partners and organizations who are doing, like, kind of hybrid models. So they're, they're bringing in adaptive where they can bring it in. They're utilizing it in different ways. But they're creating their own kind of version of this to, again, focus on that time and the elimination of waste. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Let's let you get back to your presentation uh, at slide 17. Great. So let's start talking about mission continuity at Temple. Mission continuity defined. So first of all, we do have an emergency management function. That's also me. But I keep those hats separate. I really do. Second, we have risk management, which, you know, risk, risk treatment strategies that might focus on things like insurance to provide um, you know, some kind of reimbursement for a loss. We might, we have a compliance officer, we have that. And I really want to emphasize the fact that continuity stands in a special place. It has its own special value that is separate from the other kinds of risk functions. At the end of the day, most of these departments and people don't know how to recover their operations. If they lose their primary platform, like maybe a marketplace platform, they don't know how to get through the back door. And this is the kind of thing that we can really help people figure out. I have a broad mission at Temple, academics, research, business. I mean, we are a business at the end of the day, but our real mission is providing academic instruction and research. All that operation certainly supports the other mission functions. And we do have a clinical uh, health system as well. We workshop this. So when we're doing um, work with a department, and I will talk to you about a case study, we start with an introduction, and then we do this kind of essential function by essential function, drill down, build out, and practice. Sometimes there'll be two meetings. Sometimes it'll be five or six meetings. When we start with that overview, I really do want to establish what are the most essential functions. 
And I think that that is where sometimes people get bogged down. A lot of folks don't always know how to define what their most essential functions are, meaning, again, we're not talking about long-term recovery necessarily. We're talking about that messy duct tape together space where we keep going as an institution. That means we've got to pare it down. So when we worked with campus safety services, this is an operational unit, obviously, at Temple. We have a very large police department, 130 sworn officers, uh, 400 or so contract um, security. And though the department has six or seven you know, functions, there's really only three that are absolutely essential and cannot be interrupted at all. So there's no point in even talking about recovery time objectives when we're talking about whether or not the police can do their job. So radio room dispatchers have to be able to communicate. Downtime has to be as minimal as it possibly can be. I mean, that is a dire situation if we lost radio or police operations. So we need to create a bias for action here and an ease in carrying out those functions. Another very important piece here that I think brings a lot of value is a focus on physical losses rather than wasting a lot of time on the assessment of every possible emergency or disruption. It doesn't matter what the disruption is. If you lose your people or your space or your stuff, you have to flex around that. So for example, for campus safety, Loss of essential personnel. That means we don't have radio dispatchers, we don't have police officers, we don't have security officers. How do we get more? What do we do about that? Losing special spaces like a communication center. That's a very unique space. It is not a typical classroom space, right? So I need to really focus on that alternate location. That sounds a lot like traditional business continuity. But again, if it's supporting a very primary essential function, it's mu very much worth the time and investment. If I lose essential stuff like technologies, maybe the ability to commute over, communicate over radio, we have to have some alternates there. So how do you get to the bottom of this? I mean, this is where I think there's an interesting combination of, of Really, ethnography, if you want to, I mean, it's interesting. I do have a, a degree in anthropology, a master's degree. And when we drill down, we're really trying to say, what's the essential function? Let's do the deep dive. I want to understand the picture here. And then I can really understand what is the information that we need to collect? What do we have to know? And how do we identify in some of those solutions? So the interesting thing about this is when I was engaged in in traditional business continuity for a number of years, people would just become bored and frustrated, no matter how creatively I tried to go through that initial business impact analysis. It just deadened the room. It was like a joy kill. But when people have these conversations where you start with the essential function and then you begin to discuss how does this happen, what are the backups, who knows what, is Cheryl the only person who knows how to do X function? Well, we got to fix that. And solutions just start popping up all over the place. And this is what gets people excited. So as a sidebar, I think that we have a lot to learn from another area called design thinking, which is a problem-solving methodology, again, coming out of the business world, but really focused on creative problem-solving. Constraints are more contextual than anything. To me, this is the context. I'm not focusing on if the nuclear bomb drops on Temple. If that happens, we're done. Sorry, we're closed for business. I mean, maybe at some point there's some revival, but that's not what continuity is really about. There's a lot of other issues also that are going to be solved at a very high level at executive leadership. So for example, if we lost a building that was 100% classroom space, Temple would need to figure that out. They'd need to lease a new building. I mean, we simply are at 98% capacity space-wise right now. But what would be valuable is if a department considers the needs of special spaces like a research lab or communication center. Because if that happens, the executive leadership doesn't know how to solve that problem. And we really need to create some ideas and backups beforehand. I'm coming to the most important part here, because this is really the focus of adaptive continuity planning. Capabilities. So what are capabilities? Capabilities are paramount. 
And this differs from what much of the traditional business continuity world tends to look like. So my experience has been that traditional BCM emphasizes data collection and documentation of that data. Focusing on capabilities means that the effort is actually in finding the solutions for actual recoverability. How are going, we going to recover the essential function if we lose, if we have physical losses of people's space or our important stuff, which includes IT? This is focusing on resources, procedures, and competencies. So laptop bags, new servers, communication tools might be in the resources part. In procedures, outlining the how-to and the who does what, elements of a strategy, creating decision trees for how do we navigate this even in a crisis situation. And competencies are, competencies are really the people part. You know, we have a lot of assumptions about managers' abilities to get their teams through a crisis, but we provide no crisis leadership training. And these are the kinds of things, redundant training, crisis management skills, you know, the team skills, the, the ways that we get that tacit knowledge. We know that people lose cognitive function during a crisis. So instead of giving them this heavily detailed written plan, it's much easier for people to navigate simple tools like a, a checklist, a decision tree, a swim lane diagram. So the swim lane is on the right. That means who does what during this process. On the left-hand side is a decision tree, meaning when the question comes up, how, depending on how we can answer that question will depend on the, the route that we take. This is all from process um, visualization. And this comes out of all kinds of different fields that can be easily applied to continuity, and it provides a great framework, I think. Finally, we all know in emergency management, and certainly in other campus safety functions, the importance of exercising. It's really about making sure your procedures work. So maybe you gave too many jobs to Cindy in the transfer to an alternative site. Or maybe the communication plan isn't going to actually work if you lose your hard lines. Um, hopefully, when you do any kind of exercise, you identify gaps and some new solutions. And I always say, you know, God, I hope we find some gaps. I mean, to me, the strengths aren't that interesting. Once they're a strength, they're a strength, and hopefully you keep that going. But you really want to identify places where you can really increase your recoverability. And as we all know, it's extremely hard to measure preparedness, even increase preparedness, but improvement planning, exercises, action steps, these all really help. I'm going to leave you really with the idea here that recoverability is the focus. And this is really how, when you're thinking about what you're doing in continuity, and when you're talking to your executives about getting buy-in, this is really the question. This is the goal of continuity. Are we doing things that increase our ability to rapidly and efficiently recover? Simply, efficiently, quickly. And it doesn't really matter if we're, reco if we're talking about recovering you know, the academic mission before the IT mission. Everyone wants to recover at the same time in order for us to function. So what do we do to ease that process and facilitate that process? The good news here is that we really can learn from other arenas and adapt to, to our continuity processes. What's already worked? We can learn from other fields. Experiment. Take time to build this. Start with a pilot. Tear it down. Rebuild it as you go. See what works. And beware of a template mentality. That question has come up a lot. It doesn't usually work that well. And it usually annoys people, especially data, you know, data platform templates that they have to fill out once a year, that drives people bonkers. So I really do hope I can you know, help provide some feedback about you know, how we, we can do that in a different way. Innovate. Take a fresh approach. See what we've got. What is the ideal end result? And, and is there a, a possibility that could be even better? So don't start with solutions. Start with asking the right questions. And finally, influence. So a lot of times people don't know exactly how to get their senior leadership on board. But this goes for everybody. 
just like in emergency management, you need to use your soft skills and leadership ability to engender personal buy-in and relationship building with, with your partners. They don't care what you know until they know that you care. I love that quote. Thank you, Emma. I'm sure you're going to say it again because it's a really good one. But don't just collect the data. Help solve people's problems. And this is when they will care about your agenda. So I'm happy to pass this off at this point. And you know, we, I think we have some time for questions. So Steve, I'll pass it back to you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, Amanda Gullings wonders if you have a template available for your methodology. So Amanda, I, what we're doing is developing a framework, kind of like an operational manual. We're not using templates, though we use some worksheets to just help steer the conversation. The truth is, is that what we found is each department really has different kinds of needs. And this is a little bit time intensive, so that could change with some time. Um, but I'm happy to share you know, some worksheets as we start to develop them in time. Uh, Kim, uh, Kim says, you mentioned working with campus public safety. With your limited time as the practitioner, how do you choose which departments to work with? Do they come to you? Is there a higher mandate? That's a really good question. I really believe that different institutions are going to handle this in different ways. Here's how I've approached it. Massive institution. I'm the emergency manager. Part of emergency management is identifying what are called emergency support functions. So in a critical incident, who needs to get going first? Police, facilities, student affairs. I've started with the ESF functions first. And once we work our way through the ESF functions, you know, we will start doing other kinds of, of uh, you know, kind of workshops with, with schools and colleges and departments. But we also are having some lateral meetings that cover things like IT, no matter where you're situated, or covering academic continuity, no matter where you're situated. So uh, hopefully that gives you a kind of a clear strategy. Thanks, Sarah. Um, someone asks, in terms of disruptions or crisis, how do you account for the difference between the impact of loss of physical things and virtual things, like loss of databases or data? Um, well, they're both really important, right? Um, and I think part of the upfront planning is to identify what data is so critical and where that is stored. So for example, if you have a school, like maybe you have a research school that has tons of important critical data. They have it on their servers in the building, right? Is it backed up somewhere else? Is it all on-prem? Or is some of it cloud-based? Is there some redundancy? This is something that I've actually found really interesting because I've, a lot of times, because of the expense of backing up data, not everything is backed up. And so we often assume it is. It isn't. That is what I think of as that stuff. I mean, physical loss of, you know, the loss of data counts just as much as the physical loss of, um, a, of a building or a space. Thanks, Sarah. Um, we will be uh, pausing once again for questions for both of our speakers, so keep them coming. And at the end of the session, we will be able to ask questions both to Sarah and Emma. But for now, um, we're going to turn the floor uh, over to Emma Stocker from Portland State. Emma, go for it. Hi. Did my mute button unmute successfully? You are, you are perfectly unmuted. Thanks for checking. Super. Yeah. So hi, everybody. Again, thanks for, for joining us. I'm going to take just a moment to first click into the right pod and then talk about the initial polls. So you answered two questions when you joined the webinar. Um, the first one was, why are you here? What motivates you to, to attend the presentation? And I feel heartened that nobody said avoiding other work, which means that it, it's clear that you um, are here because you feel this is part of your work and, and part of your um, objectives, you know, for your program, for your professional development. Um, so it didn't just seem like a shiny, fun thing, a way to spend your afternoon. Um, but then folks are pretty spread about sort of where they are in their own process, 
for continuity, either they feel like they have nowhere to, no idea where to start, they're feeling stuck, or trying to convince people. So um, a lot of different things are bringing folks to this conversation today, and I think that that's really valuable. Um, and if there are folks you're seeing who are also on the webinar that you know, you know, ask them where they are in their process and connect with other practitioners. I'll mention it again later, but one of the things that, that's been really helpful for me in my process is that Sarah and I have actually been chatting regularly for the last year or so, um, maybe even longer, about adaptive continuity and bouncing ideas off each other and sharing experiences and here's this article and design thinking. She mentioned that, introduced me to that idea. Um, so find somebody maybe who's at a similar place to you. Um, and then the other question we asked was about um, the role of a continuity planner on campus. And we asked the question and we put some of those options out there. There's not really a right answer. Um, there are a few that we thought were, or were rather trying to make the case that, you know, it's not really the role of a continuity planner to coordinate all operational data during a crisis. And Sarah mentioned that when, when she described the presentations she saw where folks just kept piling on and piling on, here's what else continuity can do, here's other data that it can collect, and thinking about really getting down to the essence of it and saying, whoa, like we're really, we want to focus on recovery capabilities. So it's not necessarily about enhancing emergency management plans or being the overall resilience planner, but what are we doing to improve that recoverability. So thanks for participating in those polls. So what I'm going to share is about my experience and process here at Portland State. Um, personally, I've also been doing COOP in one uh, form or another, continuity planning, um, business continuity, it, it goes by many names, for about 10 years, um, working with cities and counties and building tools and uh, building out those enormous Excel spreadsheets um, that Sarah mentioned, and I'll admit, I loved it. I love it. The Excel spreadsheets, it's, you know, 15 nested pages, major macros and linked cells, um, but, uh, and also using some various tools on the market. But when I got here to Portland State, um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm entering my third year here at Portland State, we're ready to move into continuity planning, but the challenge is that it's just me. So in prior institutions or prior times when I've been able to do continuity planning, I've been part of a larger team or connected to other campus resources, and um, I don't have that here. So I'm thinking about trying to build this from the ground up at, at PSU. Um, how do I do that when, you know, it's really not uh, a good use of my time to try to build this massive Excel spreadsheet? And I, I want to do it if it in a way that brings value to this institution, which is unique from the other institutions I've worked with. It's, you know, we say our campus is like a small city, but it's not a city, it's, we're different. So, um, and then placing it also within the environment that, you know, we do have some questions that occasionally come from our insurers. Do we have a continuity plan? That's one of the 700 questions they ask on an annual basis. Again, it's one of the 700 <laughs> questions they ask, and they would want a yes or no. And how do I answer that in a way, or how do I provide the, the context for our um, leadership at PSU or our insurers, whatever that environment is, um, that, that we do have a plan of, of some kind. Um, so on Amazon, I had the Amazon logo on there. I was buying a different book about um, organizational change and resilience. And Amazon, in its wisdom, suggested, hey, you might like this book, Adaptive Business Continuity. And this is the same book that Sarah had, was describing earlier. And when I got into it, um, and Sarah's absolutely right, it's, uh, it's a really interesting read. It sort of blows the top off of the traditional continuity planning. It doesn't necessarily offer that implementation guide. It's a lot of great inspiring ideas and, um, you know, sort of stimulating conversation points. But here's the things that appealed to me about what they were saying for continuity. Focus on the few essential questions. Um, and they propose that time, scope, and cost, which Sarah mentioned, are those key parameters, those key pivot points, which will tell you um, a, a lot about how you can recover. Um, you know, for me, scope came down to about can it be scaled down or does it need to scale up? Um, Time is about, you know, how long until this becomes a real pain point. And planning thresholds. Sarah mentioned again, 
you know, we're, we're not actually going to be using the same kind of continuity planning um, or the same kind of recovery concepts for when we deal with a large earthquake. It's just not, it, it's, a, it's a novel um, uh, kind of emergency. We're going to have to come up with different kinds of benchmarks for how we recover for that. Um, but uh, the planning threshold, what, what is reasonable for us to be planning for? And having that conversation first before you mandate that a department answer X, Y, Z question. I also appreciated that the, this approach focuses on what's important to the unit. They really give a lot of credence to um, starting with what the unit cares about. And maybe they you know, feel regularly the, the crunches from understaffing um, and meeting those payroll deadlines or something like that. Or a unit that I'm working with right now, they, uh, their building got renovated, they're moving, moving their offices, which is a very public-facing office, twice in the span of two and a half years. That's a phenomenal disruption. So starting the conversation there with the unit um, will keep them at the table, bring them to the table. And then focus on identifying gaps in recoverability. Again, this is something Sarah was discussing, um, and uh, reality wins. It's something my mother says to me a lot <laughs> when I was growing up. You know, what's the reality? What are the real resources we have on the table? Um, there's you know, we wish we could have X, Y, Z, we wish we could have more money, we wish we could have more time, um, but the, what you have in front of you, are, that is your toolkit. That is what you have available to put the pieces back together. So identifying what those rea real pieces are in advance will help keep the conversation sort of, you know, scoped within a, a realistic uh, expectations. So. When I got here, when I was talking about how to do continuity planning here at Portland State, you know, it's easy to be in a uh, sort of a challenge f uh, mindset, right? I'm thinking we have no prior formats, um, we have only one staff person, that's me, but then it's important to get out of that, get unstuck from that, and think about those really as opportunities, or for me they became drivers. So no prior plans here mean, meant that my departments that I was going to be working with had no ingrained notions, no expectations about what this conversation was going to look like. So it might feel like, oh my gosh, I'm starting from scratch, but actually, that's an opportunity. And only one staff person here, that's me, um, I actually got connected with a business student in supply chain management, and she's been working with me for a year now. Uh, she said the first date we worked together was May 22nd of last year. Um, and She's been able to help me keep this momentum. And as we're building our implementation here at Portland State, she keeps very on the forefront this question, how do we build this to be repeatable so that when it goes back to just it being me, um, that it's feasible for me to pick up and keep going with. So turn those into drivers for me. So what we did here at Portland State, last summer, myself and this student took a really deep dive into the Adaptive Business Continuity book. For me, I was trying to compare and contrast how it was different from other existing models. For the student, she's a business student again, she got to think about and write about for, for class credit, how does this relate to current key ideas in business management? The things that Sarah was mentioning, agile, scrum, so on and so forth, supply chain management. So that she got a benefit out of it as well. In the fall, we had a pilot run of, this, of our, our implementation with just one portion of the human resources department. It's a depart big, big department, covers a lot of ground, super essential, but um, we just focus on payroll and benefits. And we structure that as four engagements, an hour and a half each, um, and we got to learn what aspects of our questioning really resonated with them and got some feedback. And just now, here um, in the spring 2019, we're holding multi-departmental workshops, um, and there's two of them. I've got nine distinct units that are participating. Um, and it was important to me to right-size this because going back to a department over and over and over again and saying, hey, can I have more time? Hey, can I have more time for this continuity planning? You know, in the past, with the, with the models that existed, that's not all often bringing them value, and they don't want to. They don't get it. They don't see how it connects. So I really wanted to focus on those essential questions that bring value to the units and be very efficient with our time. So we've got two meetings of three and a half hours each 
and we are packing a lot into it. And nine units are there in the room with me, and it, it ranges from one person from those units to, I think I've got a group of five from the registrar's office. Their whole leadership team came. So actually, I'm going to talk about, it, about why these departments and how these departments. These are the units that are um, engaged with me right now. Campus Recreation, uh, Department of Multicultural Student Services, Honors College, which is an academic unit, but we're just focusing on their administrative pieces. Transportation and Parking, the Center for Executive and Professional Education, which is very externally facing. They do a lot of professional development courses. And the Office of Student Financial Services. So why these departments? And Sarah was asked the question about how do you choose the departments? I really, I did a blanket email to literally every unit and every person I've worked with in the last three years that I've been here at Portland State. And I was hoping I'd have about four. Like that was kind of our benchmark. Different kinds of units we thought we could get um, a good sense of if this was working. And so this blew me away that I've got nine departments. The DMSS folks, they actually break down into separate units. Um, and I thought about it for a minute. I said, how, how, do, how did this happen? I feel really grateful for it. It's all about the relationships. So I had been working with these departments in one way or another, providing service to them in helping campus recreation understand how they can deal with winter weather closure, for example. Uh, Office of Student Financial Services, I helped them as sort of an emergency management project manager about a year ago through a big crisis. Um, with the uh, Department of Multicultural Student Services, they had asked me to review their emergency plan that they had created, and we had a couple of great conversations about that. The Disability Resource Center, DRC, there on the list. I have a history of engaging with them. We work really closely in terms of evacuation assistance. How do we plan to support people who use mobility devices or who can't use the stairs during an evacuation? Um, and then the transportation and parking team, I was on a leadership uh, training uh, course with one of their, their leadership there. So it's not random. These folks didn't show up because they knew what continuity was and they were excited about it. We knew each other and they trusted me um, and the work that we had done together in the past to be willing to you know, jump in on this pilot. And I was very clear with them. I said, you know, this is new <laughs> and I'm gonna ask for your feedback and we might have to call an audible in the middle and really change it all up. But um, they were willing to come to the table, which I think is sort of a key piece in, as we're trying to build these programs um, when we're not able to find a template or you know, when we recommend, don't just take a template and plop it down on your departments and on your units. So I'll talk a bit about the workshops that we've set up. The first workshop, again, each is three and a half hours. We spend some time identifying services. We talk about disruption, and that is along the three parameters that Sarah was mentioning. I call them people, places, and things. It's nouns, pretty easy to remember. Um, and for that, we focus on the storytelling. What have they been through? Because unlike emergency response planning, which is that's outside of normal, that's the extraordinary, or you know, recovery planning, which is sort of long-term, high-concept kind of kind of planning. The, I wanted these departments to know that they actually do this on a regular basis. They had two staff leave at the same time you're in continuity mode. How do we get to the end of the month and make our deadlines? You know, you've got two office moves in, a, in, in the span of two and a half years. You're in continuity mode. How do you deal with that? You have equipment stolen or vandalized, so the parking garages, you know, the main parking garage doors won't open. You're in continuity mode. To get them into that headspace of, you know, we've done this before, actually, and, and get them to talk about what they learned. So let me talk about scope restrictions. Here's my favorite questions. Um, does your function have a role in campus-wide response and recovery? That's, a, that's sort of a, you know, a flag that we might need to make sure that this function has uh, robust planning. Can it be scaled down? Can you narrow the focus um, and, and really get more simplified about your process? And again, they know that. They have to answer that question. I don't know that. And then um, a question that I find folks respond well to and this is about t the time threshold, is how long until the pitchforks come out? And it might be the students, it might be parents, it could be regulators, it could be campus leadership. Um, you all know what that means. When is somebody gonna, gonna notice that there is a disruption here? Um, so we had them identify all their services, walk through these lines of questioning, and pick their top five. Now, 
I didn't dictate what the five were. They chose it. And the point is that they learn this methodology and then can apply it to more and more of their services as time goes on. Our session two, we do a little bit of an exercise. Um, and you might say, how do you do an exercise when you don't have a plan yet? Well, this is the fun stuff. This is what they want to do. Um, so we, I have a real simple uh, format. They pick cards from a deck. It gives them a scenario, a date and time, and the number of people they're missing. And they just brainstorm in the moment. Then they, they can take that with them and use that in their staff meetings um, or at their annual retreats or anything like that. The second session, we really get down into that capabilities conversation that Sarah was talking about. So the first session is really about getting them in the right mindset, um, and then we get down to these important nuts and bolts in the second session about current capabilities, um, those planning thresholds. The way I ask that question about planning thresholds is when do you push it up the chain? Like how long, what, how, what's the magnitude of disruption you could endure before you go to your boss and say, we're in trouble here? Right? We need more resources, we need more people, I need an extension on this deadline, whatever it is. Because they know that. That's part of their normal discourse. Um, and and I, I really want to emphasize that, that this is not about the, ex the beyond extraordinary. This is about some of those regular disruptions. Available resources, identifying what's available within the department, institutionally and externally. This really differentiates how critical it is to come up with additional plans. If we've got internal resources that can be supportive, of an HR staffing shortage, that's going to be easy to plug into. But if we don't have that internally, then we're going to have to go externally. And we might need pre-existing MOUs. We might have to understand, do some cross-training with another university. And that takes work in advance. So this differentiates where we can um, spend more time in their planning. And then the, they identify the steps to improve recover recoverability. They identify those actions. Here's what I, say, what I say about what this is not. We're not doing emergency response planning. This is not evacuation. Um, I also am pretty upfront with folks in saying, you know, I'm not here to, I can't solve these problems for you, but we're coalescing your ideas and resources in a unique way so that you know where you need to be working more specifically, right? Where do you start? Um, I promise no homework in these workshops. Um, so that they, we do all the work together. Um, so they don't have to think about it, they don't have to, you know, insert it into other pieces of their day. I also am really focused on empowering the units. They, they know how to deal with this. We just need to get them to the place where they see that. Um, and they do it all the time. They do it already. They have the agency. But it is my role to facilitate the conversation and keep those disaster dams, catastrophic Cathy's, the collapse of society's dams, you know, keep them from moving the conversation to a place where it feels impossible because this is possible um, and it is 100% doable. So what worked for me over the course of this last year, find a buddy. Uh, that's for me, that's been Sarah at Tempo. Uh, get fresh eyes. Uh, working with the students has been really valuable. Uh, reality wins. What are my resources? So both for the departments, but also, you know, I don't have a huge mapping department here. I can't GIS everything. I can't do huge visualizations. So what does that mean for my planning process? And also being honest about the time it takes to build this um, and improve it from phase one to phase two. So that's my story about how we've been doing this at Portland State. And I'm looking forward to some conversation and questions. Thanks, Emma. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that have been uh, coming into the chat pod for both Emma and Sarah. Let me start with you, Emma. If the traditional plan is less in favor with the adaptive community, what does a deliverable look like? Oh, it's a great question. My boss keeps asking me about that. Um, and I won't say exactly that I'm dodging the question, but um, there's a lot of desire for a plan. And it's like a security blanket, honestly. Um, so there is some documentation of sort of the department profile that we've created. And then about three different dashboards, I would call them, that help. Um, we want to make in the moment decision making tools so that no matter the kind of incident, the department leadership or the people that are left standing can look at the list of services and functions and say, okay, this is mostly a people impact. Here's the functions that are going to be most, you know, disrupted by that. Is it mostly a places impact? Here's what we need to be focused on, you know, in the next operational period, if you will. So, so there's some dashboards, but it's not the same kind of like extensive data, extensive PDF documents. I really avoid that. 
A couple of items from Jess Johnson. Uh, Emma um, just mentions that Ohio University has a document online explaining the disaster deck game, if anyone's interested in seeing it explained, and he gives a, a, a URL. Are you familiar with that? I'm, I'm not. Maybe I was and forgot about it and then, and then thought I made something up unique. I just needed uh, something quick and easy to give to the departments. But great, I'm glad they do. I'd, I'd, I'll look at it. Uh, Jess, Jeff, Jess Johnson also has a question for Sarah. Sarah, being that you provide more of a framework instead of a template, how do you maintain a level of standards for continuity plans in terms of content and details? Do you look over all the plans and approve, or do you even see the plans at all? So this is an interesting question because, again, we're at the tip of the spear here. Um, we're creating a new approach to how this is done, which means that the deliverable is not necessarily the traditional, you know, wordy, long continuity plan. Um, we're creating those three things, competencies, procedures, and resources to make departments more recoverable. At the moment, we're very much involved in driving the process with every partner we work with. In fact, we do create the decision trees as and the swim lane diagrams and these visual procedures as they work with us. Um, that may not be sustainable forever, but the thing is, is that we're basically hammering out a new set of portfolio options, and that's what we see as the deliverable, that this becomes a true portfolio of strategies that's located in multiple places. Sure, it can live in a binder and look like a plan and have a nice you know, data snapshot page. We do have a data tracker that we've created in Excel to help us keep on top of all the details. But I really think that the key here is that this is not shoehorning something into the old process. It's really a new way of approaching the whole methodology and the entire, like, sort of end goal of what continuity is trying to get at. Um. Earlier, there was a conversation among folks in the chat area begun by Brad Cyphers, who asked, are any schools using a software or web-based application to aid in the building of continuity plans? Justin Stewart mentioned that uh, the University of North Texas is using Koali Ready. Julie mentioned bold planning solutions. Uh, Brad said that they're using Koali Ready also. Um, Sarah, do you have any comments on that? Uh, sure. I mean, there's loads of platforms out there, um, and people are always trying to find new ways. Fusion's a really popular one. Um, of course, I know the ones that those folks mentioned. The, the key here is, what's the goal of the tool? Is it for you to collect a ton of data and put it in the tool, or is, it the, is the key for other people to access the tool and update their plans? And I think that the proof is in the pudding. Do people do it? I mean, are people just cutting and pasting what they've done before? without really focusing on how they make their department more recoverable? Are they practicing those strategies? I think, you know, it's great to have a platform, and that's a wonderful resource if, you can, if your school can afford it. But that resource needs to actually have some kind of true value. Otherwise, it's just not worth it. Yeah, Emma, would you like to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that... Uh, what, yeah, exactly what Sarah was saying. What is the value that this is bringing? You know, what's the goal of the tool and what value does it bring? If it's going to print me out, you know, export to PDF, and I get a hard copy of a 300-page document for a unit or for the entire university, is that really a tool? Is that really a value? You know, I, it, there is certainly the quote, right, planning is everything, plans are useless, but, but departments want something tangible. And in that moment of panic, to have a 300-page a, a binder, you know, that could be something to literally lay your head on. Or do we want to help them create dashboards that help prioritize in the moment based on any of the kinds of impacts that they're facing? Um, they're, the, the templates and the, the models and the tools are, are really um, tantalizing. I have personally not found them particularly valuable. Thanks very much, Sarah and Emma, and thanks to all of our viewers and questioners from around the Internet. Check the NCCPS webinars page in the next week or so for a link to the captioned recording of today's presentation, as well as a link to our speaker's slides. The brief evaluation survey I mentioned earlier should already be in your mailbox. It will take you no more than two minutes to complete. Please do. We read and act on your comments. Our next, in, in our next Campus Public Safety Online, we address once more, by popular demand, the topic of campus threat assessment. 
This will be a special 90-minute webinar taking place on Thursday, note Thursday, May 16th, from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We'll be welcoming once again Welcoming once again Marisa Randazzo, CEO and co-founder of Sigma Threat Management Associates. To provide perspective on the legal issues associated with campus threat assessment, Marisa will be joined by Jeffrey Nolan, an attorney with DINZY PC. The topics covered by Marisa and Jeffrey will be determined by the questions you submit when you register. The registration URL is on your screen and clickable, or surf on over to the National Center webpage at nccpsafety.org. That's nccpsafety.org. You can register for this webinar until one hour before it begins, but in order to submit a question for Marisa and Jeffrey to discuss, you must register by Tuesday, April 23rd, which is one week from today. Again, the registration URL is on your screen, or you can go on over to nccpsafety.org. Campus Public Safety Online is brought to you by the National Center for Campus Public Safety with support from the University of Vermont Continuing in Distance Education and the U.S. Department of Justice. Special thanks today to Andrea Young and Dan Cardella. This is Steve Borona. See you next time on Campus Public Safety Online.